So, all right. So let me just go ahead and start recording as well. Uh, this is such a great conversation. Professor Sam Vaknin, I feel like I know you because I've listened to you so much. You're one of the most intelligent people on this subject that I, I listen to. And uh, it is such a pleasure for me to actually get to speak with you. So thank you for agreeing to have this conversation with me. Thank you for, for having me. I don't know if I'm one of the most intelligent, but I definitely pioneered the field. I started my work in the late 80s and early 90s when there was, there was no one, nobody online. I was alone for 10 years, <laughs> nine years actually, all alone. The only website and the only support groups for victims of narcissists were mine. I owned them and moderated them and so on. And so for nine years, I've been a voice in the desert. And later on, there was an avalanche of uh, you know, people joining in. And many of them never heard of me even. But they are my intellectual descendants, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I feel like I'm pioneering the area of negotiating with narcissists mm -hmm. uh, as in the legal sense. I, I know when I started on YouTube four years ago, talking about how to negotiate with narcissists as a lawyer, I was definitely the only one. And then it started that people were reaching out to me. Oh, it, do you know any lawyers that are specializing in how to negotiate with narcissists? And I'm like, I'm the only one that's doing this. So there's no such thing as lawyers that are specializing in how right. to negotiate with narcissists. Yeah, that's, true. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Lawyers, so, even therapists, there were no therapists specializing in narcissistic abuse or narcissism. Now it's a cottage industry, mind you. Everyone and his dog is, is in it. But uh, there was a very long period, about 20 years, when there were no specialties. There were no like a lawyer specializing in narcissism or a therapist specializing in narcissism. And even in academe, it was pretty rare to find someone who was specializing in narcissism or even in cluster B personalities. So it's a late, it's a late phenomenon, very late. Right. I mean, I, I would say that um, you know, I've been practicing law for 24 years, almost 25 years, which is crazy to me. But I would say that most of the time, people would say that oh, the husband is controlling or the wife is crazy. It was really only just the last few years that you would start to hear that everybody's a narcissist, this one's a narcissist, but they really didn't understand what that meant. And so I really started researching it and studying it because everybody was accusing people of being a narcissist. So I wanted to start winning in the courtroom. And so I started really deep diving deep into what it was and what narcissism is so that I could win in the courtroom. And then I also had a narcissistic business partner and, and there's a lot of narcissism in my family. And so I wanted to really learn about it. And, but you were one of the ones that I started really researching because of how um, amazing your resources are. So it's, it's great for me to, I, I was so happy when you connected with me on LinkedIn because I thought, oh my gosh, this is, I definitely want to talk to you. Thank you. I'm more of an academic type. Um, my work, my recent work, when I started my work, I was more a victim advocate. But in the last um, 13 or 14 years, I'm 100% academic. So mm -hmm. my lectures are not accessible. I wouldn't say they're accessible to the wider public. <laughs> they're very, I mean, the language is very florid and very highly specific and there's a lot of reliance on academic sources, studies, and so on and so forth. And I indeed cater to the needs of clinicians and therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and judges. And I cater to, to, to a niche of people who are supposedly professionals and they need reliable information. And a lot of the information online is anything but reliable. Mm, which is why I like, which is why I like it. <laughs> uh, um so you know 
one of the articles that really jumped out at me, and 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 you know, and just for the people who are listening, um, Professor Sam Vagnon is the author of many many resources, but one of the books is Malignant Self Love: Narcissism Revisited, as well as many other books and eBooks in the topic of psychology. He actually says that he is a diagnosed narcissist. Um, he has had um, a, a number of, of, of different uh, resources that he talks about, but he deeply understands this topic. And w- uh, one of the articles that really jumped out at me was what a narcissist really thinks of you. And I just thought this was so fascinating because I think that uh, this really is uh, so interesting to me how they see you and um, and that you really shed light on uh, what you call the four S's and um, and how a narcissist is formed and, and that they come from, it comes really more from the mother and and how you see them as weak and because I always say the narcissist is more afraid of you than you are of them and how a narcissist is formed and the whole thing and so I really want to start start there Um, but then I have so many of the things that I want to talk to you about but I really want to start there and you know kind of how a narcissist sees the other person Um, so if you could start um, with that I would I would love for you to kind of well that, that one is is a short one the short answer he doesn't <laughs> simply <laughs> the narcissist is incapable of perceiving other people as separate to him and as external what narcissists do they convert other people especially people who might be significant I, I call these people insignificant others <laughs> mm. they convert other people who might contribute somehow. They could contribute narcissistic supply or sex or services or safety or whatever. When a narcissist has reached a conclusion that you can do something for him or for her, half of all narcissists today are women, by the way, which is a major development. Mm -hmm. Less than 20% of narcissists uh, in the 1970s were women. Mm. And now half of them are women. Mm. Anyhow, when a narcissist comes across someone he thinks might be of use, in whatever way, what the narcissist does, he converts that person into an internal object. There is a representation, a snapshot, an avatar um, inside the narcissist's mind that represents you. From that moment on, the narcissist continues to interact with that representation, with that snapshot, not with you. He is incapable of perceiving you as external, separate, autonomous, agentic, independent, with your own wishes and hopes and dreams and plans and and decisions and emotions and cognitions. All these are threats. Any hint of autonomy and independence is a threat. So the narcissist absolutely is compelled, it's a compulsion, is compelled to convert you into a figment of his imagination an element in it, within his own internal landscape. Mm-hmm. That way, in his mind, in his delusional, distorted mind, he had acquired, he, had, he has acquired control over you. Now that you are an internalized object, he controls you 100%. He is unlikely to be surprised by you. You are unlikely to betray him or abandon him, and so on and so forth, because you're inside his mind. You're a captive. You're a hostage. So you're an extension of the narcissist, a tool, an instrument. You're objectified totally, and so on. He doesn't see you. That's precisely the issue. What the narcissist does, he converts you initially within a process known as the shared fantasy. It's not it's not my discovery. It's someone by the name of Sander in 1989. Within the process of the shared fantasy, the narcissist first converts you into a maternal figure. By the way, uh, this has nothing to do with your genitalia. The narcissist converts everyone into a maternal figure. His his best friends, her husband, everyone becomes a maternal figure. 
And then, uh, in order for you to qualify as a maternal figure, you have to prove to the narcissist that you are a good surrogate mother substitute. You have to love the narcissist unconditionally. He tests you. He abuses you in order to test you. Will you still love me despite everything? Um, and then he expects you to provide him with two out of the four S's. The four S's are sex, services, supply, sadistic or narcissistic, and safety, your mere presence. If you provide him with two out of the four, you qualify to become a new mother. And then you become a mother. He never sees you. He never ever sees you. He idealizes you at the beginning. Then you become a mother. Then you become a service provider. Then you become a body to masturbate with. I mean, he never sees you. You're a possession. You're an object. Indistinguishable from, a, let's say, a refrigerator or a smartphone. And he's equally attached to you as he is to his smartphone. Actually, I've just misled you. He's much more attached to his smartphone than to you. So there's no process called cathexis. There's no emotional investment. Everything happens in the narcissist's mind. There's a theater production going on inside the narcissist's head, in his mind. And you are a prop, like a theater prop. You just happen to be there. So it was a bit of a long answer because people can't wrap, wrap their minds around this. They, they can't accept this. They say, oh, I've been chosen because I'm special. I'm kind, I'm generous, I'm empathic. That's why the narcissist chose me. The narcissist wouldn't recognize empathy and kindness if they fell on his head. And he couldn't care less who, who you are. He couldn't care less who you are. You are fungible. You're replaceable. You're interchangeable. The proof, of, the proof of this is in the pudding. When the narcissist dumps you the next day he's with someone else. The alacrity is breathtaking. <laughs> so... You're nothing. You're you're simple. I don't know what else to say. It's so the narcissist doesn't see you. Even the language betrays us. Even the language betrays us because we keep saying the narcissist sees you as, whereas the narcissist never sees you. Mm. I mean, it's frightening, but they do this push pull thing because as soon as you start to try to leave, right, and you start to say. That's it. I'm done. Because you get all the way to the edge. And then they do try to pull you back in because they don't want to see those S's leave. So they do know what to say. And I always say everything they do is a manipulation. Everything they do is a manipulation. And they're very, very good at knowing how to mirror you, how to say exactly what they need to say to pull you back in to their fold, right? Yeah, in both narcissism and in borderline personality organization, um, for example, borderline personality disorder, we have something called approach avoidance repetition compulsion. The narcissist and the borderline, the borderline more so than the narcissist. And many, many narcissists are actually borderline, as well as narcissists. This is a very common comorbidity. So narcissists approach you, and they have to be the ones who discard you and dump you. They have to be the ones who devalue you. They have to be the ones who break up with you and end the relationship. They must be the ones, because they're embedded in something called the shared fantasy. And the shared fantasy is a highly choreographed, reenactment of the narcissist's relationship with his mother. The narcissist needs to get rid of you in order to resolve early childhood conflicts with his mother. If you are the one who is doing the discarding, if you are the one who is doing the, who is initiating the breakup, you are actually undermining the integrity and the longevity uh, of the shared fantasy. And the narcissist has to lure you back in order to finish the movie the way it should be finished in order to go through the motions and the almost automatic rituals that are involved in the shared fantasy you have to be there as i said safety presence your presence is crucial your presence is a you're, you're a prop you're but it's crucial 
So the narcissist cannot allow you to walk away. And if you do, he engages in something called hoovering. He tries to hoover you. Another comment I would like to make about what you said, you said that narcissists are Machiavellian. In other words, they're manipulative. Yes, but they're Machiavellian and manipulative, unlike the psychopath. The psychopath is goal-oriented. The psychopath would manipulate you in order to obtain goals. The narcissist truly believes his own nonsense. He truly believes his promises. He is immersed in the shared fantasy. He is delusional. Um, many, many scholars, myself included, <laughs> believe that narcissists are psychotic, in effect. They can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. They have what we call impaired reality testing. So when the narcissist embarks on a shared fantasy with you, he believes his own fiction, his own stories, his own promises, and his own rendition of reality, what, something known as paracosm. So yes, the narcissist is highly manipulative within the shared fantasy, but he is in it with you. He is as committed to the shared fantasy, as credulous, as naive, <laughs> Uh, as you are, actually. And when he lures you in, he's luring himself back in as well. It's a joint enterprise. That is not the case with the psychopath. The psychopath never loses sight of reality. The psychopath knows very well when he's lying to you, when he's manipulating you, when he's deceiving you. The psychopath is after your money, your sex, your something. The psychopath is after something. The narcissist needs narcissistic supply and he needs a good mother within a shared fantasy. End of story, basically. And so we tend to confuse narcissism with psychopathy and narcissism with borderline. And there's a good reason for that, comorbidity. In other words, many, many people are diagnosed with all three, borderline, psychopathy, and narcissism. There's actually a variant of narcissism known as malignant narcissism. Mm -hmm. Malignant narcissism is a confluence, a delectable confluence of narcissism, psychopathy, and sadism. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, here's the thing. I, 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 the way I've kind of uh, separated narcissistic supply for people when they go to negotiate with a narcissist is I think that there's a hierarchy of narcissistic supply. And that is the way I've looked at it is, I call it diamond level supply versus coal level supply. And those are my terms. And, and that is when you go to negotiate with a narcissist, I think that there's a, a you know, their image is what I call diamond level supply, reputation, how they look to the world and that they will, protect and defend that more than anything. And then what, what I call coal level supply is what I call like the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply. And that's like the control or the smearing of people or the, uh, you, you know, whatever they'll do to move goalposts in negotiations or holding on to people or that, uh, you know, during the discard phase, what they will do to, to just keep the, the negotiations going just for the, the pure um, sadistic part of it, right? I mean, it, you know, what I've seen in negotiations is actually that they will self-sabotage in order to keep somebody in that web of destruction, right? Yeah, that's very true. Um, but, um, but the, the way that I tell people that they will get out of it is that they have to create leverage such that they will, um, they have to threaten a source of supply that's more important for them to protect or defend than the supply that they get from manipulating that other person. And that source of supply is going to be tied to their image um, because they will let go of what I call this coal level supply 
in order to protect this higher level source of supply, which is their image. Would you agree with that? Well, in the 1990s, that's precisely what I said. I suggested that there are two types of narcissistic supply, primary and secondary, and that each of these two types has a three a, th uh, a three level category a three level category so you have high grade supply low grade supply and mid grade supply okay Th that's my original one, yeah so um and that primary supply is the most crucial to the narcissist secondary supply is a kind of maintenance supply and that of course there are varying qualities of supply and high grade supply matters the most to the narcissist. It is true that the narcissist would sacrifice himself in order to hurt other people. But it's important to it's important to make a distinction between the narcissist in the throes, in the midst of a shared fantasy, and the narcissist having exited the shared fantasy. Once a narcissist is out of the shared fantasy, he becomes very psychopathic. He becomes mm -hmm. antisocial. Mm -hmm. Because he's no longer emotionally invested in the shared fantasy. He, mm -hmm. he is uh, the the other person is an enemy. We call it a persecutory object. Mm -hmm. That's an enemy, and then the narcissist becomes vindictive, sadistic, manipulative, indistinguishable from a primary psychopath. Actually, yes. but that is only outside the shirt fantasy. As long as the narcissist is inside the shirt fantasy with a willing, consenting partner or even enthusiastic partner, then many of these manifestations are much reduced because the narcissist is very wary of losing the partner. He has severe abandonment anxiety, separation insecurity. So yeah. he's, on his, he's on his best behavior. Mm -hmm. But the minute the shared fantasy is over, he has discarded the partner, or God forbid, the partner has discarded him, then of course you're going to see the ugly face of narcissism. Yeah, I, and I they agree. turn on a dime. It's it they have because it's they have like that splitting part of their personality. So it's black to white in or white to black and in, in a immediate. You're either for me or against me, and if you're against me, then it's public enemy number one. Splitting is an is an infantile primitive defense mechanism, typical of two years old. And it is when the two-year-old, between between the ages of 18 months and 36 months, to be precise. During this period, the child divides the world into all good, all bad. For example, mommy is all good and I'm all bad, the child says. If the child is abused, traumatized, mistreated, the child has to make sense of this kind of misconduct by the parent, parental misconduct. So what the child says, I deserve it. I have it coming. I am worthy of punishment. I'm a bad I'm a bad boy. So that's an example of splitting. I'm all bad. Mom, mommy is all good. Later on, the world is all bad. I'm all good. The world is all good. I'm all bad. You know, right and wrong, black and white. It's black and white thinking. The clinical term is dichotomous thinking. So splitting is very common in borderline personality disorder and very common in narcissistic personality disorder. Yes, right. black and white. And you are all white and you can do no wrong, and you're perfect, and you're amazing, and you're hyper-intelligent, and you're drop-dead gorgeous, and you're unprecedented in the love-bombing phase of the shared fantasy, when the narcissist is going through the process of idealizing you as a new mother. And of course, you're the exact opposite in the devaluation and discard phase, where you can do no right, and you're ugly, and actually you're much more stupid than he thought, and so on and so forth. And how does he explain to himself that he has misjudged you so egregiously at the beginning of the shared fantasy? He says that you have changed. You have changed. You have changed owing to other people's bad influence on you. Or you have you have been you've you've been acting, you've deceived him, or something. The the, the onus is on you. It's, it's your fault that he has misjudged you at the very beginning as a perfect being. You know? Right. Right. And then they have to make sure that they they have to take you down before you can take them down. So they have, to, they have to go smear you. They have to go uh, make sure that everybody knows. And and then you become public enemy number one. 
and they use the court system and they use the children as pawns and whatever they means they can they can and and what i tell people is that their limbic system then actually takes over and it shuts down the neocortex part of the brain at that point and they're no longer dealing with rational or reasonable they're literally dealing with a two-year-old in a an adult body at that point. The narcissist is always a two-year-old in an adult body. I don't think a narcissist is ever rational, actually. <laughs> no, mm. no. But it, it, what I think judges need to understand, mediators need to understand, people in the court system needs to understand is that you know, when you're sitting across from this person in a negotiation, they're not interested in let's come to a rational, reasonable conclusion. Let's save fees. Let's do what the right thing for the children or, or anything like that. They're looking at, I want to, I mean, when I was still practicing law, I mean, obviously I do this full time now, but when I was still practicing law, I would have narcissists that, for clients and they would say, I'd rather pay you than her. And I would be like, well, I don't, I'm sick of you too. I don't want that. You know, <laughs> I want to be done with this. But, th but that's really what they will do. And they will self-sabotage they will self-sabotage. And that's the scary thing. That's the scary thing. Yeah. They don't perceive it as self-sabotage. Their top priority is to restore their sense of grandiosity. Grandiosity is a cognitive distortion. It's a misperception of reality. It's an inflated, fantastic self-image and self-perception, which hides, camouflages, disguises a very brittle and fragile uh, core or lack of core, <laughs> absent core. So the narcissist values his, his grandiosity or her grandiosity more than anything else, more than anything else. And from the narcissist's point of view, it's an absolutely rational behavior mm -hmm. because protecting, defending the grandiosity, restoring it, reinstating it, demonstrating it visibly, ostentatiously, one-upmanship, winning, winning, recasting the enemy as evil and decrepit and corrupt and in the eyes of the world, thereby elevating the narcissist morally. All these have to do with grandiosity. The minute the shared fantasy is over, um, the narcissist's grandiosity is damaged, is hurt. And um, there is a process known as narcissistic injury, and in rare cases, narcissistic mortification. The vast majority of divorces involve narcissistic mortification. Narcissistic mortification is a, an injury to the grandiose, inflated, fantastic self-image that is rendered public, that becomes known to a larger circle of people. So then it involves humiliation and shame. Narcissism is widely considered a defense against shame. The child is ashamed. The child is abused and traumatized and so on. There's a lot of shame there. And the narcissist is defending against this shame. And when the narcissist is dumped or discarded or when the shared fantasy collapses or whatever, it's a failure, of course, it's a defeat. The, technical, the clinical term is collapse. And then the narcissist feels ashamed, humiliated. And he needs to restore his godlike, unblemished, perfect self-image and he needs to convince other people of that because he is reliant on input from the environment he doesn't do internal regulation he regulates his internal world from the outside that is narcissistic supply mm -hmm. so it's not enough for the narcissist to say i know that i'm the good person and i know that my wife is the evil horrible b <laughs> that's not enough he needs other people to tell him, you are right. You have convinced us. She is truly evil and you are the victim. He needs this. That's why the smear campaigns, that's why the intransigence, that's why the apparent irrationality, self-sacrificial sometimes, 
because he can give up on money, he can give up on power, he can give up on sex, he can give up on his own, on his freedom. He will go to prison, but he can never ever give up on his grandiosity. Without his grandiosity, he is non-existent. There, there, there is no core, there's an absence there. Yeah, so it's, it's that fragile, fragile ego. And But, you know, I, I do always say they are more afraid of you than you are of them. So the stronger that the other person becomes, the more afraid that they get. And so when they do create that leverage that that threatens that what I call diamond level supply, you're calling it primary source of supply, which is their image. No, no, I have high grade supply. It's the same like yes. diamond. Oh. High, high grade supply, that's the key. That's the key. Yes, but it's important to understand that they are not afraid of you for reasons that you would that you would comprehend. They're not afraid of you because you can dam you could damage them or be they are afraid of you because you can take away their grandiosity. You can humiliate them. You can shame them into having to face themselves in the mirror. They are exceedingly delusional. Again, to the point that many scholars, many prominent scholars like Kernberg and less prominent scholars like Wachmin think that narcissism is actually a form of psychosis. It's so delusional, so sick. So if you were to expose the narcissist confabulations, prevarications, fantasies, self-invented biography, you know, if you were to expose the narcissist, reveal who he truly is, the Wizard of Oz, essentially, yeah. behind the curtain, yeah. the narcissist is defending the curtain. It's the curtain that the narcissist is defending. Exactly what I always say. And he's, exactly. ter he's terrified that you will pull away the curtain. He's not terrified that you will take away his money or you will put him in prison. Or Yes, of course, that's unpleasant. But his terror is that it will become known who he truly is. Not a giant, oh, not a giant, you, but a midget. That is what I say all the time. It's exactly, and it's the only way that you will be able to get them to get rid, to cut that source of supply from you. Yeah. The only way. Yeah. If you, legally of course, yes. are capable of exposing the narcissist for what he is and who he is, there's no greater threat as far as he's concerned. He would do anything. He would compromise. He would give you everything. He would, just to prevent this from happening. He would Correct. become initially aggressive Initially, it would become aggressive and vindictive and maybe even violent and so on. But when he sees that it's not working, he will suddenly, he's a bully. It's a bully. He's a bully. And the best thing you can do with a bully is terrifying. 100%. And whenever I'm helping people in these negotiations and they say, I'm still not out of it, I always say, you haven't figured out a way to threaten that source of diamond level supply yet. Because when you figure that out, he or she will be done. You'll be done. How do we how do we cope with bullies? It's a very bad idea to communicate with a bully, to compromise with a bully, to negotiate with a bully. Extremely bad idea. The only way is power, force. There's no other yep. way. There is only way. And I tell people, I know it feels uncomfortable because you want to, I don't want to fight. I don't want to do this. I, I want to be done with this peacefully or whatever. I just want what's fair. You want what's fair. You're dealing with a narcissist. This is the only way. And I must say that, um, however unpalatable it is, I must say that many people, uh, being exposed to the narcissist could be addictive because narcissism brings to the scene a lot of drama, a lot of excitement, a lot of color. It's a, it's a lively life. It's a kind of, you know, in a state of excitation and arousal on a constant basis. It's difficult. It's difficult after you've after you've been with the narcissist. Some people find potential dates and so on boring. So it's difficult. Difficult to let go of it's I mean, even when you discard the narcissist and break up with the narcissist, it's difficult to let go of the narcissist. 
clinically, there's a, uh, there are two processes involved in training and introjection. I'm not going to it right now. The narcissist is inside your head, inside your head, still catering to many, many of your psychological needs long after he's out of your life physically. So I think many people are trying to find excuses to stay in touch with the narcissist. Even litigation is a way of staying in touch. Mm -hmm. And of course, the famous excuses, I want my child to have a father, for example. Yeah, that's why the narcissist is in my life, because I want my child to have a father. Or, um, you know, uh, sometimes I can see the inner child in him. And this child is in need of love. Or, uh, people come up with the most amazing concoctions just to allow them, however indirectly, to stay in touch with the narcissist. Because there is an element of addiction in all this. Definitely. Definitely. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, I think it's, you know, that, that dopamine cortisol uh, back and forth, right? Because they get that dopamine hit when they're love bombing. And then there's that cortisol because of the 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 stress hormone. You know, that's what's going on in the victim as well. Um, and I think that's what causes the trauma bond. Um, but I think that um, there's also, to me, they look for vulnerabilities in people, right? And they know that there's that opening because, you know, you mentioned the Wizard of Oz. I think the Wizard of Oz is all around such a, a perfect um, analogy for everything narcissism, right? Because I think that the, the narcissist is that wizard behind the curtain and really just that weak, little fragile ego behind the curtain. I also think that they they look for people who are easy, easy victims, right? You know, not, not to say um, that you know, I think that people who are empaths and who end up in these relationships are, are usually good people, people of high value. But I also think if you think of Glinda the Good Witch, right, who was like knew who she was, who's very um stood in her power, she was obviously remember at the beginning of the movie where the wicked witch came near her. And she flicked her away and she was like, go away, you have no power here. <laughs> Remember that? And, and the Wicked Witch was like, oh my God, I'm not going near her. She was like, please, please lady. And I think that that's a very good um, analogy for narcissists because narcissists do not go near people who know who they are. And they don't prey upon that, right? I think they 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 are they look for people who are going to be good sources of supply. This is where I would beg to differ. First of all, uh, empath is not a clinical term. I regard it as a self-aggrandizing term. Okay. I regard it as a form of narcissism. Okay. I I fully believe that many of the people self-identifying as empaths are actually covert narcissists. Okay. Um, so we'll put it aside. It definitely has no place in an academic discourse. Yes. But let's say empathic people. Um, by now we have a substantial body of studies on victims of narcissistic abuse and so on. We fail to find this. We have not found any common denominator. There were strong women. Most of the victims are women. That's still a fact. There were strong women and weaker women. There were broken women and fully integrated women. There were educated women and less educated women. There were rich victims and poor victims. We found, despite well over 25 years of efforts, we failed to find a single common denominator. Definitely, when it comes to a personality organization, in other words, more empathic, less empathic, more kind, more, more, more dark, more. Narcissists seem to have, they're promiscuous in the sense that they seem to have no preference. Availability is a major factor. That's the only factor that we did find in dozens of studies. If the person is available to participate, 
then the narcissist is all over that person. <laughs> now, it, it, it's probably true that a person would be available to participate in the narcissist shared fantasy because she is vulnerable or he is vulnerable at that point in time. So that person may have undergone a life crisis, maybe a divorce, something, and the narcissist is is the answer. So there could be um, there could be transient vulnerabilities that are the outcomes of circumstances, life circumstances, and life crises. However, there is no type. That I insist on this. All the academic studies and my experience, there is no type. There, it is not true that the narcissists, narcissists prefer weaker people, more empathic people, more kind people, more generous people. I regard all this as a form of self-aggrandizement by the victims. The victims want to believe that they're special, they're nice, they're empathic, they're kind, they're generous, when actually they are a crosscut of the general population. Some of them are nice, some of them are very not nice. <laughs> Some of them are empathic, some of them are totally disempathic, some of them are psychopaths, many of them are narcissists. Mm. I don't think that uh, there is, regrettably, online organized competitive victim, which I find to be very destructive to real victims. And this competitive victimhood is, as I said, self inflating and self aggrandizing. It is entitled. It is very reminiscent of narcissism. It is splitting. These people split. The narcissist is all bad, is demonic, and I'm angelic. I'm impeccable and blameless and blemishless. You, you could see all the hallmarks in, of narcissism among these self-proclaimed victims. And I'm very, very, very much against this phenomenon. It is not grounded in reality of the reality that we could find in psychology. And it is definitely strongly indicative of narcissistic traits or narcissistic personality style, if not full-fledged disorder in many, many of these victims, so-called victims. So I'm not denying, how can I deny? I, I was the first to describe narcissistic abuse. Uh, let's not forget that I'm the father of this. So <laughs> I'm not denying that they're real victims. I'm just denying the assumption that the real victims are online and that the victims we see online, the, so, the self-proclaimed victims that we see online are the real victims. I'm denying that completely. I, I mean, I've certainly seen a lot of victims that are men though as well. Men as well, of course. Uh, I mean, and I mean, I've also, I mean, and you've written a lot as well on, um, how leaders can um, attract movements of 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 people into um, their uh, you know and and victim and, and and attract victims that way right uh, who are narcissists I mean and so and and there's CEOs who can attract um, victims through uh, who who are narcissists I, I mean i think people who are particularly charismatic or um i don't know if it's the leaders themselves or if it's the people who are susceptible um but they uh attract masses of people and i know that you've written about that um recently uh, I'm trying to be delicate about this because I try not to get into politics, but um, I know that you've touched on this recently. And I wanted to just see what your thoughts are on that. You know, how do these leaders, whether they're CEOs, whether they're po politicians, attract masses of people? Whereas it's incorrect to say that there is a type that, uh, the narcissist is attracted to, or that is attracted to the narcissist, that is incorrect. It is very correct to say that narcissists gravitate to highly specific professions. So, for example, we find five times more 
psychopaths among chief executive officers of Fortune 500 companies, five times more than mm. the general population. Wow. It is wow. It's amazing. Mm. We find a preponderance of narcissists in specific professions. There have been studies, for example, of rock stars and media figures, show business figures, and so on and so forth. We find a high representation of narcissists. Of course, we all know that psychopaths and narcissists are overrepresented in the prison population. That is the work of Robert Hare and Baby Ark and others. So it is true to say that there are enclaves um, and professions where narcissists are overrepresented. Now, when the narcissist, why why do narcissists gravitate there? Because they can obtain supply. It's all about supply. Of course. A narcissist is charismatic because the narcissist says, as a political leader, because the narcissist says basically two things, three things. Number one, you do not need to think, you do not need to take responsibility, you do not do not need to be accountable. You do not need to do anything. I'll do everything for you. Mm. That's a great relief, isn't it? Jean-Paul Sartre, the father of existentialism, suggested that it is the need, it is the, the need to choose, the need to decide that creates anxiety. And so when someone takes this away from you and tells you, you don't need to decide any, anymore, I'll make all the decisions for you. It's a huge relief. Number two, the charismatic leader tells you you're perfect. He idealizes you. He tells you you're wonderful. Mm -hmm. You have no flaws. Mm -hmm. You deserve me because I'm perfect. I'm perfect. And since I chose you as my follower, that means you're perfect. This is a process known as co-idealization. When the narcissist idealizes you, what is he saying? He's saying you're perfect. You're, you're amazing. You're this and that. And that makes me perfect because I own you. You're mine. So that means I'm perfect. So this is co-idealization. So this is the second element. And the third element, the political leader creates a shared fantasy. He says, the future is going to be much better than the present. If you follow me, the future will be amazing, fascinating. So these are the three irresistible offerings you know just follow me you don't need to make any decision you're perfect you're flawless and i'm leading you into an amazing incredible future whereas your present sucks these are the messages in a way this is what the narcissist does with his spouse with his children in the shared fantasy known as the narcissist family. It's a cult. This is a cult mentality. It creates a cult. Yeah, of course. But, you know, they're constantly gaslighting them. And then, you know, they they say things that are, uh, that, uh, you know, they're constantly lying and uh, saying one thing and, and doing others, right? Um, actually, actually, studies show that narcissists <clears throat> do not gaslight and do not lie. Uh, what they do, however, they mislead you. That, that part is true. They mislead you greatly by making promises that they never keep, by introducing you into a fantasy and taking you away from reality. They, they mislead you horribly. But they believe their own confabulations. They believe their own stories and they believe their own promises. Psychopaths lie and gaslight. Mm -hmm. Gaslighting is premeditated, is intentional. And the person who gaslights maintains reality testing. In other words, the person who gaslights you knows that he's gaslighting you. He knows that this is a fantasy, a, a story, <laughs> a piece of fiction. The narcissist doesn't. He's really into it. He believes, he believes his own story, his own piece of fiction, his own theater product. So they and believe that it, it's like, a, it's not a lie if you believe it? It's, no, it is, uh, it is misleading. If you, if you believe that what you're saying is true, then yes, it's not a lie, of course. Right. It doesn't sit with the definition but, of a lie. But, but they don't ever keep those promises. They don't keep their promises because of the dynamic of the shared fantasy. But when they make the promise 
they 100% believe they're going to make, they're going to keep it. They do not future think. People confuse narcissists with psychopaths. Mm. Narcissists are delusional. They're mentally ill, seriously mentally ill. Like, mm. like you would not blame a psychotic person for saying, here's a giraffe standing in the living room. And he fully believes there's a giraffe standing in the living room. You won't say he's lying. He's lying. There's no giraffe there. He's mentally ill. But that's why they don't want to be held accountable. So accountability is a, is a different issue. Your lawyer, you know it better than I do. But the narcissist, when he makes an utterance, when he makes a statement, fully believes in it. Fully believes in it. While the, whereas the psychopath knows he's like it. He knows he's gaslighting. And of course, there are many narcissists who are psychopaths, which creates this confusion. But it's important to reconceive of the narcissist as someone who is not in control of his mind. He is as sick as a psychotic. Psychotic has hallucinations. A psychotic hears voices. A psychotic believes crazy things. You know, same with a narcissist. If a narcissist tells you, uh, we're going to get married, we're going to have three children, and we're going to have live happily ever after, when he tells you this, when he's telling you this, he believes it 100%. He's committed to it 100%. Right. But, and, and this is why a person who is uh, getting out of this relationship, I tell them constantly they need to put this invisible shield down around themselves and start looking at this person as if they are observing them, observe, don't absorb, respond, don't react, and just start saying, you know, you need to look at this person as if they're a toddler having a tantrum on the floor and, 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 uh, and just, and um, distance yourself from this person because. Very true. They are mentally ill, basically. They're mentally ill. That's the issue. As, as if they have autism or whatever, right? Yeah. The, the best example is a psychotic because a psychotic also comes up with an alternative, alternate reality. Alternative reality. And the psychotic is convinced of that reality. He tells you, what are you talking about? There is a giraffe in the living room. Can't you see it? And the giraffe is talking to me. Can't you hear it? Mm -hmm. And the psychotic gets really pissed off if you say no. He he thinks you're manipulating him. You're it's the same with the narcissism. Today, right. today right. we are reconceiving of narcissism in three mm -hmm. ways. Number one, it's a post-traumatic condition. Mm -hmm. So it's a CPTSD reaction. Number two, the narcissist is a toddler. A toddler. That's why therapy fails with the narcissist, because therapy is for adults, not for toddlers. Mm -hmm. We need to use child psychology. And number three, he is really, narcissists are really, really, really mentally ill. The great Otto Kernberg thought and suggested that narcissism is a form of schizophrenia, that it is as bad as schizophrenia which is the worst mental illness we know, we know. I agree, narcissism is as bad as schizophrenia. It's, it's horrible, it's, a narcissist is no longer with us, is not in reality. Now the thing is that narcissists have learned to simulate people, simulate adults. So they appear to be adults. They are good at their jobs, they are, you know, they are eloquent, they are <laughs> knowledgeable, and this simulation works wonders. And then we get pissed off at them. We get angry. And you're right. I'm not contesting that they mislead you all the time. 100% of the time. It's just not premeditated. That's the difference. And they don't know the difference between reality and the bullshit they're selling. They right. don't. So they, they, So you have to take a strategic approach. You have to distance yourself. You have to get out of this relationship and start... Um, taking steps to start documenting, start doing what you need to do to expose them so that you can um, that and get out of the relationship and not expect that they will ever be able to be rehabilitated. Fully agree. I've, I've, I never tried to imply during this conversation that narcissists are not dangerous. They're exceedingly dangerous. I never tried to say that the, the impact their impact on you is uh, benign. 
It's not benign. It's malignant. I'm just saying, if you want to cope with the narcissist efficaciously, you need to understand that you're dealing with a mentally ill person who has severe difficulty to tell apart reality and fantasy and is very protective of his fantasy, of his godlike fantasy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you need to have this key to the narcissist's mind. When you're dealing with a psychopath, the psychopath is rational. Psychopath is goal-oriented, you know? Mm -hmm. He can negotiate. He mm -hmm. often compromises. He makes mm -hmm. deals. He's a deal maker, you know, psychopaths. They are coercive, they're violent, they're aggressive, they're unpleasant, they're defiant, they're reckless, I agree. But at least they are understandable, they're comprehensible. The narcissist lives in his own world, in his own on his own planet. It's like the little prince, you know. And you need, if you want to strike, if you want to survive the narcissist, you need to visit his planet. Pretending that the narcissist is merely a malevolent adult will not get you very far because he's not an adult and he's not malevolent. He's, he's just a bad influence. He's just he's destructive. But it's not malice like the, the psychopath. Psychopath is malicious. Mm -hmm. Of course, as I keep saying, and I said here, many narcissists are also psychopaths. It's not that I'm saying that you should the two mm -hmm. are totally, you know, many narcissists are also psychopaths. Right, or borderline. Or borderline. It's about 40% of narcissists are comorbid. So they are borderline and, and psycho. And by the way, borderline today, we are reconceiving of borderline personality disorder. Right. Or, or, somewhat, bipolar. or bipolar. somewhat psychopathic. Right, or I've seen bipolar as well. Well, bipolar is wrong. Bipolar is a mood disorder. It's nothing to do with borderline. But borderline personality disorder today, we know when the borderline is exposed to stress, to anxiety, to tension, to abandonment, real or imagined, the borderline becomes psychopathic, secondary psychopath. She becomes highly psychopathic. Mm -hmm. So whichever way you look, you end up with an antisocial creature, some, somewhat psychopathic. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I think is that they very often, and I see this played out in history as well. I certainly see it in negotiations. Uh, and, and I think, in, you know, even based on some of the writings that you've talked about recently, you've talked about some of these leaders and, um, you know, you've mentioned some of the recent leaders um, in history. Uh, I think if you look at Napoleon, you look at um, Hitler, I think that narcissists end up overplaying their hand. They end up self-destructing because they, they make critical mistakes that end up leading to their downfall and they end up overplaying their hand and they end up causing their own destruction uh, because of, of overplaying their hand. What do you think about that? Fully agree. Here, there's no debate between us. But it goes to show that they don't perceive reality correctly. It's exactly proof of what, what I've been saying. Because the narcissist misperceives reality and himself in reality, he's grandiose about himself and he lives in fantasy. He makes mistakes. He overplays his hand, he underestimates the enemy, he, he misreads emotional cues, sexual cues, social cues, exactly like people with autism. The narcissist is very bad at... at uh, at, um, with social behavior. Narcissists have something called, uh, that, that I dubbed called empathy. It's a combination of cognitive and reflexive empathy. So they can scan you for vulnerabilities when they're negotiating with you or anything. They can scan you for vulnerabilities and leverage this to some extent. But their inflated fantastic self-perception is such, they're so godlike, they're so all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, they know everything can teach them nothing, they can learn nothing, that, that ultimately, they're so stupid. Mm -hmm. If I have to use one word, narcissists are dumb, mm -hmm. seriously dumb. They may yeah. be knowledgeable, they may be intelligent, for example, look at me, but they're dumb. I always say about myself, by the way, that I'm probably the dumbest person I ever met. <laughs> I am super knowledgeable. I think I'm intelligent. But I'm dumb. Why am I dumb? 
because I don't gauge reality properly, because I don't learn, because I don't evolve, because I don't evaluate people, appraise them correctly, because I misbehave as if there were no consequences to my actions. These are great definitions of being dumb, you know? And us is a dumb, simply, because they are enmeshed, immersed in fantasy, and they refuse to have anything to do with reality because reality flies in the face of their grandiosity. Reality challenges and undermines the thing that is most precious to the narcissist, his self-perception and self-image as perfect, a perfect entity, divine. Yeah, I mean, and I've seen them lie even when they don't have to lie about things that they don't even need to lie about. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. It's part of the fantasy. Mm -hmm. the, the fantasy is um, largely superfluous. The irony is between you and me. A narcissist could find a partner, for example, an intimate partner, without the fantasy. There's no need for the fantasy. It's utterly unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Many of the things a narcissist does, many of them are unnecessary. And they are responsive or reactive, reactive to internal dynamics. They have nothing to do with the outside, with other people, with reality, with circumstances, with the environment, with demands or expectations. He's not responsive to the world. He's responsive to what's happening inside him. So many of the things he does, many of the choices, many of the decisions, many of the war, many of the statements he makes, many of the many of them appear to be totally superfluous and self-destructive and self-defeating. Mm -hmm. None of this is needed. Many narcissists are good looking, they are, you know, wealthy, they are even famous, or they are knowledgeable and intelligent, captivating lively they don't need the fantasy right and yet they would impose the fantasy on you mislead you hurt you break your heart you know because they can't help it and this is what we call in psychology compulsion narcissists are compulsive mm -hmm. they can't help it you can't help compulsion i mean you can treat it but you can't help it it's it's beyond your control they're out of control the irony Narcissists, narcissists are all about control. They want to control you. They want to control the, the, the kids. They want to control the workplace. They're all about, they're, they're control freaks. They're hysterical mm -hmm. about control. Mm -hmm. The reason is they're out of control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no self-control there. So if you would give anybody one last piece of advice, what would you say? Your gut knows best. It's been documented since 1970, 70. It's been documented that we have a reaction to narcissists, which is immediate. This reaction is known as uncanny valley reaction. When we come across narcissists and psychopaths, there's a tiny voice inside us that says something's wrong, something's awry, something's off key. Uh, it's too good, it's, it's crazy, it's something. There is, you have a gut instinct, you have an intuition that tells you uh, this person you're faced with is not well put together, is half baked, <laughs> not full fledged human. Some modules are missing, like empathy, like positive emotions, like treating other people nicely, kindness, you know, the, some modules are missing. And this is within the first few seconds. Uncanny Valley has been documented in. Mm -hmm in various studies in Japan, started in Japan, has been documented within less than seven seconds, fewer than seven seconds. So trust your instinct, trust your intuition, listen to yourself, shut off, shut out the world, ignore him or her, listen to yourself. What, what the voice here is telling you? And if you have the slightest doubt, disengage. Don't let your loneliness and neediness dictate your mate selection or choices. Just disengage and walk away. It's much cheaper that way in the long run. Mm -hmm. I think very good advice. 
Very good advice. This has been such an amazing conversation. So helpful and so insightful. So Thank brilliant. You. So, so I hope you don't mind that we disagreed on some things. That is the that oh, is no, the essence, no, I love that. The essence of a good dialogue. I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I I absolutely love that. And here's one thing. Academ changes all the time. And it mm -hmm. changes by absorbing input from people in the field. Mm -hmm. I may say completely different things 10 years from now. <laughs> I may be saying completely different things. <laughs> there will be new studies, new discoveries, and so on. Right now, this is the state of the art. But the state of the art changes month by month. I think it's uh, really, really fascinating. And I, I love reading your work and listening to, to what you have to say. So thanks for, thank you for having this conversation with me. Thank you. I enjoyed I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Wait one second.